Hi everyone, it's seven o'clock in the UK. Welcome wherever you're watching us around the world this morning. When Boris Johnson confirmed that the easing of lockdown measures in England was being delayed, he said it was to allow for more people to be vaccinated. Now there are plans for jabs to be made compulsory for all care home staff looking after elderly people. We'll discuss that in just a moment with the International Trade Secretary Liz Truss, as well as asking her about that trade deal she's brokered with Australia and whether farmers need to be worried. Also ahead. It hurts, but worse. Meet the TikTok doctors. I'll chat to the medics taking to social media to dispel myths about the COVID vaccine. And in addition to that, let's do business. The Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, on why he's calling for more financial support for firms until all COVID restrictions are dropped. He'll join us at 9.20. It's Wednesday, the 16th of June. A jab for a job. It's understood COVID vaccinations will be made compulsory for care home staff who work with elderly people. NHS workers may also have to fall in line. A failure to weather the storm, scientists say the UK is less prepared to deal with climate change than it was five years ago. There needs to be much more action from government. They need, they're the ones that need to put the money in, they're the ones that need to put infrastructure in, they're the ones that need the regulations and laws to force change. Israel launches airstrikes in Gaza. The military says it's in retaliation for incendiary balloons fired from the territory. A presidential summit, but will Joe Biden's meeting with Vladimir Putin follow convention in Geneva? The final countdown. China prepares to launch its first manned space mission in five years. And some places will be cloudy, cool and murky today with patchy rain, but for the vast majority, sunny and warm again, hot and humid in the south and east and thunderstorms likely into tonight. I'll have the details for you later. Good morning, everybody. If you work in a care home looking after elderly or vulnerable people, then you'll have to have a coronavirus vaccination. Ministers want to make the jabs mandatory and are said to want to extend the move to cover all NHS staff. Let's bring in our political correspondent, Tamara Cohen, who is standing by for us this morning. Hello to you, um, Tamara. So tell us more about what the government is hoping to achieve here. Morning, Kay. Morning, Kay. We understand that later this week they'll announce that all staff working in care homes for the elderly will have to have a coronavirus vaccine. It's going to be within the next 16 weeks or they face losing their job or being redeployed away from frontline duties. The government has said all along that they believe vaccines are the way out of this pandemic. And we understand that they'll say that thousands of lives could be saved with this policy. Now, in terms of uptake at the moment, the NHS England figures show that over 80% of care home staff have had their first vaccine, almost 70% have had their second. But the concern is that this is not uniform. In some local areas, the uptake is far, far lower. And we know the health secretary has said earlier this year that some care home chains want uh, this to be compulsory. The concern is, of course, and why um, some trade unions representing the sector uh, oppose it is because they fear that it will exacerbate already acute staff shortages in the social care sector, which are also a real problem. And as far as this trade deal is concerned with Australia, what's it looking like? Well, Boris Johnson was very pleased to announce it yesterday, holding some Vegemite um, in the Downing Street Garden with the Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Um, it has to be said, although this is the first post-Brexit trade deal to be negotiated from scratch, and the government will be very pleased uh, with that, there are some concerns about farming and whether the farming sector is going to be uh, have farmers forced out due to cheaper uh, imports of meat that comes to a lower welfare standard. And that's what they've been uh, saying all along. Uh, Liz Truss and the government say that they've in put protections in that deal. So for the first 10 years, there will be quotas on how much Australian meat can be imported. But the important thing is we have not seen the text of this deal. We had an agreement and an elbow bump 
yesterday, but the fine detail will not come out until later uh, this year. And there are questions about whether uh, for the small amount that it adds to our national income, the government's own projections suggest only a fraction of a percent, uh, it is worth that hardship for farmers. And as far as farmers are concerned, I mean, looking at the figures, um, they are not at all happy suggesting this is um, showcase rather than substance. That's right, yes. The farmers have, have expressed concerns all along that some of them will be forced to the wall. I mean, what Michael Gove told us yesterday is that he didn't expect uh, this to be a huge, the UK to be a huge export market for Australia because, of course, it is 9,000 miles away and their biggest export markets for produce will probably uh, remain in Asia. But farmers remain concerned about the whole post Brexit landscape. They're going to see their subsidies phased out over the next few years. It's not clear what support they'll get for government there. And although government ministers, including Liz Truss, have said, well, they can find new opportunities uh, to export uh, abroad, uh, it's still unclear uh, what the terms of that will be. Uh, but the government say that this trade deal is going to be a win for particular sectors, what they call iconic British brands, whether that's chocolates or cars or whiskey. And they say uh, that, that British consumers will be able to enjoy um, Australian products like Australian wines at a cheaper price uh, than they they do at the moment because all of those taxes and tariffs will be eliminated. OK, tomorrow for now, thanks very much indeed. Quick look at uh, what's happening as far as the coronavirus figures are concerned for the UK today. The latest data uh, shows there were 7,673 new coronavirus cases reported in the last 24-hour period and 10 death. That means that the total number of people who died within 28 days of a positive test now stands at 127,917. Another 132,627 people have received their first vaccinations and 235,928 people have received their second. That now means 30.2 million people have now received both doses of a vaccine. Lots to talk to with the International Trade Secretary, Liz Truss, who's with us now. Hi, good morning, good morning. Good morning Thanks Kate. for joining us this morning. Um, let's start with that trade deal, should we? Um, those who are being critical say it's more showcase and substance. Well, I completely disagree with this. This is the first UK trade deal that we've struck from scratch since Brexit. It's not just important in itself, it's got huge opportunities with Australia, whether it's about the under 35s being able to go there for three years without any farm work requirement, whether it's about tariffs reduced on all British goods from whiskey to cars. But what's more, it's also about access to the wider Pacific market. So we want to sign up to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a market of 11 countries, 500 million people. And doing this Australia deal is a key part of that as well. And of course, that's where the growing demand is sure, but that's for all the kind of products and services that we sell. That's why people are saying that's why it's a showcase, because it's actually worth 0.01% of increase in GDP, about £1.20 per household per year. Well, that's a static analysis. But what that analysis doesn't take into account is that those economies are growing and they're growing fast. So we're expecting trade with Australia to increase by 30% by 2030. And with a wider trans-Pacific area, we're expecting it to increase by 65%. So what I'm doing is striking these trade deals that are going to put the UK in a very strong position you know, in 2030, in 2040, in 2050, because our businesses, whether it's financial services or technology or farmers or whiskey, you know, they will have a bigger market to sell into and the British will have better access than other countries. So this deal, for example, with Australia, we have now got more access for Brits to go and live and work in Australia than the Americans have or the Japanese have. So yep. we've got a real strategic advantage. OK, at the expense of our farmers, some might say, um, a huge increase in meat imports into the United Kingdom, 25 times what it is at the moment is what the cap is likely to be. Uh, Emily Thornbury, the Shadow Trade Secretary, as you know, saying, send our farmers to the wall, and the National Farmers Union representative, Chairman, in fact, uh, Minette Batters, saying, uh, we're really going to have to look at this very carefully. It's just not good for our farmers. Well, what we are doing is we're making sure there's a transition period for farmers of 15 years. So we're going to give Australia the same access that the EU have to our market in 15 years' time. The EU already has quota-free access to the UK. 
So they already sell us 230,000 tonnes of beef per year. What this deal is talking about is next year, it'll be 35,000 tonnes. So we, we import far more beef from the EU than we do from Australia. And what we're talking about is rectifying that in 15 years' time. It's on a sliding scale, though, of course, isn't it? it, doesn't it, it it's on a sliding years. scale, but none of, none of the amounts on that sliding scale are as big as the amount we import from the EU. Okay. And first of all, Australia mainly sell into the Asia-Pacific market, which has much higher prices than here in the UK and Europe. But what the deal will also enable us to do is get more opportunities for our farmers in those markets like Vietnam, like those other markets, where there is growing demand in the of for China. British beef and lamb. In so we need to look outwards. I think we've got to stop being defensive and look at where the opportunities are for okay. British business. How will business. this trade deal complicate matters in Northern Ireland, um, given that currently the government doesn't want to enforce any checks as far as Northern Ireland is concerned? The EU is uh, reducing checks uh, on Australia goods. The EU is going to be looking at this and saying, hang on a minute. Well, this trade deal is fully compatible with the Northern Ireland protocol. But what the issue is in Northern Ireland is we need the EU to be compatible pragmatic about the checks that are undertaken. And that was always the way the protocol was drafted. It requires compromise between the parties and the EU need to be reasonable. And that's what Lord Frost is asking for. The deal's a deal though, isn't it? Well, the deal was clear within the terms of the Northern Ireland protocol that there had to be a pragmatic approach. And that's what we need to see from the EU. So we might go past the 30th of June with our negotiations in order to try to get this deal Path, well, over the line, it's already over the line, but sorted. Well, Lord Frost continues to be in discussions with the EU to sort this situation out, but I would urge the EU to be responsible and be pragmatic uh, to sort this issue out. Um, let me talk about vaccines, if I may. Uh, mandatory vaccination for care home staff, is that the case? Well, we are currently consulting uh, on this issue. Uh, what, what we do know is that it's incredibly important that staff in care homes are vaccinated. We've got a hugely vulnerable population uh, in our care homes and making sure that staff are vaccinated is a priority and everybody who has the opportunity for a vaccine should take up that opportunity because it's helped protect all of us and keep all of us safe. Okay, sacked if they don't have one? Two? I, I, I'm not going to comment because we think? haven't we haven't got the well we haven't responded to the consultation. It'd be it would be wrong of me to prejudge that consultation. But it's clearly if you, if you had a parent who was in a care home, would I would you want, want to make sure I that... would want the staff to be vaccinated. Of course I would, because I would want my parent to be protected. Mm. What about NHS staff? Well, I think that everybody who has the opportunity to have a vaccine should have that vaccine. And that's what we want to make sure is that all adults are vaccinated. And what jeopardy should there be if you don't have that vaccination? Well, these are all issues that we're looking at as part of the consultation. And we will respond to that consultation. I can't prejudge that. But you do think... But I'm very much of the view that we need to protect everybody in society and the vaccine is a way to do that. And we've seen the huge progress we've been able to make as a result of our very strong record in vaccination. Mm. Just reading um, Jacob Rees-Mogg this morning, I'm sure you've been reading uh, what he's had to say as well. It was actually on his uh, podcast, or Mogcast, I think he calls it, very clever, um, and it's been picked up by a lot of the newspapers this morning, saying that we can't run a society to stop hospitals uh, becoming full. Isn't that exactly what we are doing at the moment? Well, what we're doing is we are taking a pragmatic approach. The key is making sure that everybody gets vaccinated uh, by the 19th of July, we'll have all over 40s vaccinated so that we are protected as a society. That's what we need to do in order to be able to fully open up the economy. But what do we think about what Jacob Rees-Mogg has said? I mean, he's completely gone off the reservation. Well, I haven't actually read his, <laughs> read his, blog, read his blog this morning. Uh, but you know, says, I, uh, Let me tell you, he says um, lockdown cannot drag on just to prevent people seeing a doctor and that uh, we can't run a society to stop hospitals being, uh, being full. Well, I agree with him that lockdown shouldn't drag on. We want to bring an end to it. We've already taken a number of steps to open up uh, parts of the economy. 
uh, things are freer than they were a few months ago. But I think we need to hold our nerve uh, to make sure that we keep levels of the virus down. And the way to do that is through vaccination. Yeah, but does he not understand that he's, he's literally the government's policy is uh, to have lockdown or, or easing of lockdown, but still with restrictions in place at the moment in order to stop our hospitals being full? That's, I mean, it's the, fundamentally... That's the whole point, isn't it? The, the, well, the whole point is fundamentally to protect people and to stop people uh, suffering severe COVID and dying. And that is why we're doing this. We are protecting lives. That is the ultimate aim. Do you accept that he's misspoken then? Well, I, I don't know. I can't, you just you just read it out to me and it's uh, in the papers. It's, you know, I mean, it's no secret. Well, Is you know, Jacob Jacob today? Jacob has his you know his views, and that's the, the, those are his views. But what I'm telling you is the what the reason we are doing this, the reason we are taking these measures is to protect lives and that's what's important. I suppose the more serious point is that it's the, the discontent with, with uh, an extension to lockdown um, is now reaching the front bench. She's the leader of the House. When you go out and about in the UK and talk to people about their experiences of the lockdown, what they want to see, there is huge support for the Prime Minister's approach of being cautious, of making sure that we do have people vaccinated before we fully open up the economy. We don't want to be in a position where we have to go backwards because we've seen a spike. And that is why the vaccination programme is so vitally important. And there's huge public support for that. Have you had both your jabs? I haven't. I've got I've got one due on Saturday, Kay. So I will be I will be double vaxxed then. Yeah. Did you have Oxford? I did, yes. Right. Were you poorly? No, actually not at all. I had to do I had to do a media round the next morning, so I couldn't I, I couldn't be poorly. For two days I was so poorly. But having said that, I'm hundred percent invincible now. I've had both jabs. And yours is this weekend. It is. Good it luck. Is. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Us. Thanks a lot. Coming up on the programme for you this morning at a quarter to eight, we'll talk to campaigners and those with relatives in care homes as MPs call for urgent action to reform the care system. How old should we be to get married if you're a teenager in love? The former Home Secretary Sajid Javid wants the minimum legal age to be raised to 18. We'll ask him at five past eight. Then at uh, 20 past, we'll speak to the former Formula One world champion Nico Rosberg about why he's pumped up about dumping petrol and now leading a global environmental festival. But first, the latest inflation figures from the Office for National Statistics have just been released. They show the rate of inflation rose to 2.1% in May, up from 1.5% in April. Our business correspondent, Paul Kelso, standing by for us. Hi, Paul. Um, Analyse this for us, if you would, please. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, Kay. Yes, uh, as you say, the uh, inflation rate has increased to 2.1%, <clears throat> up from 1.5% in April, which in itself was up uh, more than 100% on the previous month. This is all year-on-year -year figures, so we should be comparing them in our minds to where prices were a year ago when, we, of course, we were emerging from the first lockdown. And what they tell us is that the recovery in the economy is well underway. In fact, uh, the economy is, in some senses, roaring back, perhaps a little too fast for some tastes, which is why prices are rising. The main drivers of these price increases, uh, cake, uh, clothing and shoes, uh, car, motor fuel, cost of petrol and diesel at the pump a great deal more than a year ago because the oil price has risen substantially and recreational goods. So we're going out and spending money uh, both outside the home and inside. Uh, food and drink uh, has driven a lot of this uh, for that purchased outside the home. Of course, remember a year ago, that was a very limited choice, these figures for May. So we were still locked down a year ago. Now, of course, people are out and about one significance perhaps of this number today, 2.1%, it's above the Bank of England's target rate for inflation of 2%. And we've seen concern, not just in the UK, but around the world in global economies about uh, increasing inflation in the US. It's been, they've been spooked a little. We know that there's supply problems. So while there's great demand from consumers like us, uh, manufacturers are struggling to get goods to us. Will the Bank of England act and address the interest rate? Uh, the wide expectation is not now, but perhaps sooner than expected. OK, Paul, thank you. 
Also making the news for you this morning. Israel says it's launched airstrikes in the Gaza Strip in retaliation for incendiary balloons fired from the territory. It's the first major clash since 11 days of fighting between the two sides ended late last month. 21 and 22-year-olds are being asked to book their coronavirus vaccinations. The NHS says it will send out nearly a million texts today asking them to come forward. 18 to 20-year-olds are expected to be invited before the end of the week. New research suggests the number of people taking a coronavirus vaccine could increase if more treatment for fear of needles was available. A study by the University of Oxford claims around a quarter of adults in the UK are scared of injections, me included. Scotland Yard has promised to review allegations that Ghislaine Maxwell was involved in trafficking, grooming and abusing women and girls in the UK. The former girlfriend of convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein is in custody in the United States, accused of recruiting teenage girls for him to sexually abuse. The UK is even less prepared to deal with climate change conditions hitting the country now than it was five years ago. That's according to the government's own climate change experts. They say new build homes are poorly designed and can't cope with the impact of rising temperatures. Here's our climate change correspondent, Lisa Holland. With rock from local quarries, Aberdeen is known as the Granite City. Distinctive architecture, but old granite buildings are notoriously difficult to keep warm. This is the cavity, and this cavity is ventilated to under the floor, and this is vital in order to keep the inner wall here dry. Engineer David McGrath is developing ways to make homes more energy efficient and is insulating his son's granite house in Aberdeen. He believes not enough is being done to help people retrofit their homes. For old properties like this, it's vitally important in, on two fronts. One, we have to do some mitigation for climate change. But actually, a lot of the illnesses that are formed are because of the very construction of these properties. It's not just buildings that are poorly insulated or overheat which pose a risk to our health and welfare. People, nature and infrastructure are all threatened by climate change. There needs to be much more action from government. They need, they're the ones that need to put in the money in, they're the ones that need to put the infrastructure in, they're the ones that need the regulations and laws to force change. I mean, people will, will change when they're, when they're told to do so and we will take individual action but we need support in that. Buffeted by extreme weather, Aberdeen is a city which sees itself as on the front line of climate change. In a stark warning, the Climate Change Committee, which advises the UK government how to get to net zero, says the country is unprepared for what lies ahead. I think the government's response has been inadequate. We've seen that the, the, the science of climate change has improved uh, progressively over time. We've become more and more aware of the risks that we face, and yet we haven't seen a commensurate response from the government to those risks. And it's time for the government to now act on that. The Climate Change Committee says ambition needs to be matched with adaptation and insists we're now in a critical period for dealing with the impact of climate change in the UK. Lisa Holland, Sky News, Aberdeen. And for similar news and stories from the people trying to stop climate change, you can watch the Daily Climate Show on Sky News. Uh, you can join Sam Washington uh, 6.30 and 9.30 this evening. Usually Anna Jones, of course, uh, on holiday at the moment. Or if you're on the go, you can download and listen to the latest edition of our weekly Climate Cast podcast, available now wherever you get your podcasts from. More headlines for you this morning now. Elderly campaign groups say the number of pensioners in poverty has exceeded 2 million, with black and Asian older people more at risk of struggling financially. Age UK is calling on all older people to check their eligibility for pensioner credit over fears they'll miss out. We're looking at how people compare with the rest of the population. And sometimes some groups get left behind a bit. But we do know that one of the reasons why people are living in poverty unnecessarily is because they aren't claiming any benefit entitlements that they should be. So people are missing out, um, particularly on pension credit. There's nearly a million pensioner households 
who should be receiving the benefit pension credit. It's claimed more than half of firms outside the biggest 350 companies still have no female bosses. The group Women On Boards UK says less than half of these firms meet the UK's goal of women occupying a third of executive roles. Today marks the fifth anniversary of the death of the Labour MP Jo Cox. In a statement, her family said they were optimistic about a future where people recognise we have things in common. China's confirmed it will launch its first manned space mission in five years tomorrow morning. Three astronauts are due to spend several months on board a space station and will also carry out a space walk. More than $4 billion has been wiped off the Coca-Cola share price after this gesture by Cristiano Ronaldo. The footballer removed two Coke bottles from the desk during his Euro 2020 news conference. He then toasted with a bottle of water. Goodness me, they need to fix that, don't they? Quick look at the weather for you. Here's Naz. Good morning. It's all going on today. We've got hot and humid conditions. For some, we could see the highest temperature of the year so far. Others seeing cloudy skies, patchy light rain and drizzle. And then tonight, thunderstorms. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Good morning. On the face of it, for most places today, it's looking fine and dry with some good spells of sunshine, a warm day, but rather hot and humid around central, southern and eastern areas, where around the south and east we're likely to see the highest temperature of the year so far. And for some, it's looking cloudy, mainly this afternoon across southern parts of Scotland, northwest England, the west of Wales and down towards parts of Devon and Cornwall, becoming brighter after a cloudy and damp, murky start around eastern parts of Ireland and Northern, and northern Ireland too. And for the rest of Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland, there will be brighter sunny spells that will feel warm. But as I said, hot and humid down towards central, southern and eastern areas. The highest temperature of the year so far likely down towards the southeast, 30 to 31 degrees Celsius. Then tonight, torrential downpours with thunderstorms. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Oh, I was trying to remember the name for Chinese astronauts and it wouldn't come to me. I've Googled it. Do you know what they're called? Yeah. Techonauts. Techonauts is what they're called if they're Chinese astronauts. Stuart, my uh, director, is very impressed with that. Uh, also coming up for you, a chance for me to bring you a story with a very happy ending this morning. I know. A badger called Stormzy has been released back into the wild after he was rescued in Suffolk. He was found last month having collapsed in the cold, wet weather. The RSPCA says they have been able to return him after identifying the set that he came from. How did they know that? Don't they all look the same? I don't know. Still to come on the, more, uh, on the breakfast show for you this morning, joined by a former senior US diplomat ahead of today's face-to-face -face meeting between Joe Biden and Vladimir Putin in Switzerland. How lovely. That's next. Hi again, everybody. Uh, Sky News understands the government wants to make it mandatory for care home staff in England to have a coronavirus vaccine. A consultation is also underway on whether all NHS staff should be forced to have the jab. Short time ago, the International Trade Secretary Liz Truss told me vaccinating care home staff is a government priority. It's incredibly important that staff in care homes are vaccinated. We've got a hugely vulnerable population. Uh, in our care homes and making sure that staff are vaccinated is a priority and everybody who has the opportunity for a vaccine should take up that opportunity because it's helped protect all of us. Ms Trust has also said that the government's new agreement with Australia comes at a time when trade is already growing between the two countries. She assured me the post-Brexit deal would provide a major economic boost to the UK. We're expecting trade with Australia to increase by 30% by 2030. And with a wider trans-Pacific area, we're expecting it to increase by 65%. So what I'm doing is striking these trade deals that are going to put the UK in a very strong position you know, in 2030, in 2040, in 2050, because our businesses, whether it's financial services or technology or farmers or 
whiskey, you know, they will have a bigger market to sell into and the British will have better access than other countries. So this deal, for example, with Australia, we have now got more access for Brits to go and live and work in Australia than the Americans have or the Japanese have. So yep. we've got a real strategic advantage. Well, let's bring in our political correspondent tomorrow, Cohen. That may well be the case, but uh, are farmers not at all happy in uh, the NFU chairperson saying, mm, we need to look at this? Yes, although there are protections built into this trade deal to account for the concerns of farmers that they will be uh, flooded with cheaper uh, imports of meat which are produced to a less high welfare standard because the farms in Australia have different standards and are far bigger, the government say that over 10 years there will be quotas which will be phased out, uh, but the farming community say this may not stop hundreds, if not more, farms going to the wall uh, because of all the changes to uh, the subsidies that come with leaving the European Union uh, and the fact that they might now be maybe undercut by the trade deals that the government is now doing. Now, Liz Truss rejected that, saying that farmers will be able to have more opportunities to sell their produce further afield uh, in Australia and the Pacific region. Uh, she also dismissed uh, the idea that, according to the government's own figures, which said that consumers would benefit from this trade deal uh, to the tune of £34 million, which sounds like rather a lot, except it's only just over £1 per household. She said that's the figure now, but all the growth in trade over the next 10 years or so is going to come from Australia and the Pacific. And the government very much hopes that this trade deal uh, that Boris Johnson sealed yesterday with the Australian Prime Minister will pave the way for a much bigger one uh, with seven countries in the Pacific region. OK, for now, thank you. Thanks, Tamara. Uh, two of the most powerful world leaders come face to face later on today when Joe Biden and Vladimir Putin meet in Switzerland. It takes place just days after President Putin said relations between Russia and the United States were at their lowest point. Hmm. Where do they go from here? Let's find out with the former US ambassador to U Ukraine and director of the Eurasia Centre at Atlantic Council, and that's John Herbst. Hello to you. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Mr Ambassador, on the programme this morning. Where do you see the relationship between the US and Russia at the moment? Um, the relationship is exactly, unfortunately, where it should be, which is at a very low point. And it's at a low point because Mr. Putin has been running wild um, globally for the past seven or eight years. Um, his war on Ukraine, his uh, intervention in Syria, his intervention in elections in the United States and across Europe, including in your Brexit election, he's been behaving like a rogue actor. And it's taken the United States a couple of years, but over the past five or six, it has begun to push back hard against Moscow's provocative behavior. And the Kremlin doesn't like it. Hence, the relationship is not in a good spot. How does President Biden's approach to President Putin differ to that of President Trump? Well, President Trump had an odd and unexplained affection for Mr. Putin and for Russia. And he, he expressed that um, from time to time including during his infamous press conference with Putin in Helsinki in 2018. But his administration, despite that, pushed back um, pretty strongly against um, the aggressive policies of the Kremlin. Biden has a clear understanding of those aggressive policies, and he and his administration also pushed back. The important difference is that Biden, again, clearly understands the problem and expresses that publicly, as he did during his op-ed, the op-ed he wrote for The Washington Post, um, a few days ago. So he has been, as we know, he's been to the G7 in Cornwall, he's been to NATO, and now he's going to be uh, meeting uh, President Putin. Very different situation to what he's had to do over the last few days in that the leaders that he's been meeting, he's had to try and mend fences between the United States uh, and whichever country's leader he's talking to. A very different situation from what you're saying with President Putin, where he, uh, President Trump had a very good relationship with him, or a good relationship, certainly. Um, you're right that the meetings with NATO, the meetings at the G7, and also with European Union leaders, was all designed to reestablish, reassure um, our partners that we are good allies. And that was a smart play to do for going to see Mr. Putin, because this underscores the American strength um, globally. And it makes Putin's job a little bit harder. And that's a good thing. How significant then is the meeting in Geneva? What do you expect to come out of it? 
Um, if Biden pursues the right um, positions, which I think he will, no, very little will come out of it. The most important thing is that Biden has to tell Putin, stop your war in Donbass in Ukraine, stop interfering in American elections, stop interfering in elections across the globe, stop these ransomware attacks on the United States, um, and also do not, do not um, kill Mr. Navalny. Those are all difficult messages for Putin to hear. Uh, but Biden will also say that while we, we will push back hard against all these aggressive policies of yours, we have some things we can discuss where you may want to work with us, for example, on strategic um, arms, strategic nuclear arms. Uh, that's what I hope and expect Mr. Biden will say. If he does, uh, Putin will obviously not be happy about those first messages I've just described, but he may decide yes, it makes sense to sit down with the United States and deal with the nuclear arms issues. Yeah. Don't do any... Yeah. Sorry, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, don't do any of those things, um, uh, President Biden will say to President Putin, or else what? Well, you've already seen um, an American response in the past to such behaviour. Um, principally, we've levied sanctions on, on the Kremlin for such behaviour, including as recently as two months ago. Um, in connection with the war in Ukraine, the United States has provided significant military support to Ukraine, as well as sanctioned the Kremlin. Uh, but I think the other things that Biden should do, uh, this is actually very important. There needs to be some American cyber attacks on Russia. They, don't, they do not need to be spoken of publicly, but we need to demonstrate to Mr. Putin that we have a stronger cyber capability than Russia and that they will pay dearly if they continue such attacks on the United States. Um one assumes that potentially that might be happening already if they're not uh, spoken about publicly, Mr Ambassador. But nevertheless, let me ask you very briefly before I let you go. The chair of the UK Defence Select Committee told me last week that the West is facing a new Cold War with Russia. Would you agree with that assessment? Well, um, I would say we've been in a Cold War for many years. It took the West and the United States, too, um, some time to understand that. But Putin has been pursuing a policy directly contrary to American and NATO interests, including Britain, Britain's interests, since at least um, 2007, when it launched a cyberware attack on Estonia, and then 2008, when it invaded Georgia, and then 2014, when it seized Crimea and began its war in Donbass in Ukraine, not to mention all the electrical interference we've talked about going back the last seven or eight years. So the United States and the West, again, took them a little bit of time to realize this. But once they did, they began to push back. And that's when Moscow began to talk about a Cold War. But it's a Cold War that the Kremlin launched. Let's understand that. And we're merely protecting ourselves. Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for staying up into the early hours in Washington to speak to us. We do appreciate it. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, coming up, why there are calls for the adult care system to be overhauled. We'll be talking about that in just a moment. Calls this morning for urgent reform of the care system in England. The House of Commons Public Accounts Committee says there needs to be proper funding and warns the pandemic has had what it calls a devastating impact on the, on the service. Uh, Fraser Moore reports. Enjoying the sunshine and some traditional seaside fun, the residents of St Cecilia's in Scarborough. Here, as in hundreds of other care homes, Lives have been lost during the pandemic, taking a toll on the residents, their families and the staff. Those who work in the care sector say today's report by the Public Accounts Committee doesn't tell them anything new. They know action is needed and with many homes now operating at only 80% capacity, they need it to happen soon. I'd like the government to be bold and committed and to actually give us a date when it's going to start and finish the reforms, really. If they can't do that, then I suggest someone else comes in and, and, and actually does it, because we've heard promises, broken promises, over more than two decades, and enough is enough. It's about time someone stood up and said, this is when it's happening. The report concludes that care is not properly funded, lacks transparency and urgently needs reform. We've said really that the government has failed on social care and not just the devastation that it faced during COVID, but it has a track record that we have highlighted a number of times, not delivering on many aspects of supporting people in care homes and getting care at home. Residents like David, who's been at St Cecilia's for seven years, greatly appreciate the work of their carers. They're worth the white in gold. They come here at seven o'clock in the morning, ready for work. 
and we don't get on to right at night, we leave it at eight. That's a long shift, you know, and they're on the feet. Imagine the mileage they do walking around all the time. You know, just phenomenal. The staff themselves love their jobs, but often feel undervalued. You can't teach someone to care. They either have care or they don't have care, and to be able to look after people, especially with the needs that our, our residents have, that it takes some doing. Today's report calls for this government to finally deliver the reforms that have long been promised, starting with an outline by next month on how much support is needed to cope with the immediate crisis caused by COVID-19. Fraser Maud, Sky News, Scarborough. Let's talk about this in more detail. Jean Adamson um, is um, a bereaved family member. Uh, last year, sadly, lost her father to COVID-19 whilst in a care home. Um, hi, Jean. It's lovely to see you this morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, tell us what happened to your dad. Cleo, I think his name was, wasn't it? Yes, uh, my father was um, was in a care home. Um, he was admitted there after having had a, a stroke um, and was left quite debilitated. And um, he spent uh, 18 months in the care home altogether uh, before he contracted COVID um, and unfortunately passed away um, during the, the, the first wave of um, the pandemic, um, April last year. What were your favourite memories of him? Do you have some, when you think about him, that bring a smile to your face? Yes, I do. Um, my dad was a trooper um, and, and he was a family man as well. Uh, when he went into the care home, um, the, the, the doctors had given him three to six months to live because um, he also had a brain tumour um, and, they, and they'd given him that time to live. Um, and the, the doctor used to go in each week because he was on end of life care and say, um, OK, you know, do we need to review anything here? And, and in the end, the doctor said, well, why is this man on end-of-life care? You know, he's, uh, he's hearty and strong and, you know, he, he loved to sing. He would sit up and sing in bed every day. Um, you know, he was such a peaceful and contented soul. Um, anyway, in the end, they took him off the end-of-life care and, and, and he then went on to live another year before he contracted COVID in the home um, and died. Um, but um, my, my dad, I fondly remember my dad as a, uh, he's a he was a Windrush pioneer and, uh, you know, he, he loved to wear his Trilby hat and he would serenade his grandchildren with, you know, old time West Indian uh, songs. And um, yes, he, he was a, uh, a, a very, a very strong and uh, robust man, robust character. Yeah. But, but sadly, um, he did succumb to COVID and you weren't able to visit him, were you, um, towards the end of his life in, in the care home? What impact did that have on you and the family? That was very, very hard on us, you know, because we, we, we were... <laughs> you know, we, we couldn't see him. Um, and unfortunately, because of the effects of stroke, he wasn't able to communicate with us. So we, we weren't even able to, you know, to speak to him, um, you know, on the phone or, or, or using an iPad. So it, it was very hard, um, you know, being able to communicate with him at, at any level. Um, but I was... I suppose we, we were fortunate in one sense because he was on the ground floor of the care home. Uh, we were able to go and uh, stand by outside his window and at least we could talk to him through the window and he could hear our voice, you know, um, and he would sometimes respond to that. Um, but it was a very difficult time and wasn't able to say goodbye to him uh, before he died. That was particularly sad. I'm sure, Jean, I'm sure. What more do you think politicians in Westminster... I mean, this report is coming out soon. What more do you think politicians in Westminster should be doing to help um, people like your family? The politicians need to stop the infighting 
and the uh, the bickering and the um, uh, self-serving tactics that they use. Uh, politicians need to, to realise that this is a tragedy, a national tragedy on a, on a massive scale, unprecedented in our times. And it needs to be treated with the relevant, the appropriate um, uh, uh, degree of urgency. And we need to have a public inquiry as soon as possible um, so that we can understand what happened, what went wrong, um, why, why, why things went wrong, and make recommendations and learn lessons going forward so that we don't have a repeat of, of this, uh, the, 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 the massive scale of, of, of um, uh, um, tragedy. Um, again, you know, the, the massive lo loss of life. Again, I mean, we've had already, you know, we've lost over, what, 127,000 uh, people have lost their lives to COVID. Um, we're now possibly going on to a third wave. You know, we have the Delta variant now, which is, um, uh, you know, rising exponentially. Um, how many more people need to die before the government will actually to take affirmative action, get the inquiry going, and so that we can learn lessons okay. and avoid further loss of life. Okay, Jean, that's I, what needs to happen. And uh, Jean, I, I'm sure your dad, Cleo, would have been very, very proud of you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Chatting Thanks for having. Thank you. We're chatting um, to the government minister this morning uh, about uh, care homes and the fact that staff, do they need to have compulsory two jabs in order to work in care homes in future? And also, uh, do we think that NHS workers should compulsory have two jabs? We'll be talking about that. See what she had to say at the top of the next hour. But before that, something completely different uh, before the weather. The name might suggest different, but scientists say, like us, killer whales make friends. There they are. This is the footage from a team at the University of Exeter and the Centre for Whale Research, which they say proves their theory. They believe the whales spend more time interacting with specific other individuals within their pod. And it appears they are picky creatures. They apparently like spending time with whales of a similar sex and age to themselves. What happens, <laughs> what happens when you fall out with a killer whale though? I don't know. Uh, let's find out what's happening in Wales now. Here's Naz. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Good morning. All going on today, we've got fine conditions for most places, but not everywhere. There's cloudy skies likely for this afternoon across southern Scotland, uh, northwest England, the western Wales, down towards the southwest later, as that band of cloud, patchy light rain also dr um, drizzle, also clears from eastern parts of Ireland and Northern Ireland. For the rest of Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland, fine and warm, but scattered showers around the windy north and west, hot and humid for many southern and eastern areas where we're likely to see the highest temperature of the year so far. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways.